Welcome back to an all new episode of the Grand Valley State Sports Report on WGVU. I'm your host Jake Levy. This week we'll take a look at GVSU women's soccer as they come away with two late winners this weekend. We'll also run down GVSU football as they match up against Ferris State over the weekend. GVSU volleyball competed at the Midwest Regional Crossover and we'll recap the tournament on this show. We also have a double dose of features this week as we look at the GVSU women's golf team as well as the big men up front for Grand Valley football. Lock it in Laker Nation as the Grand Valley State Sports Report starts right now. Number six, Grand Valley State dropped a 35-28 decision to number three, Ferris State, Saturday night before a Lubber Stadium crowd of over 17,000. GVSU falls to 5-1 overall. We'll hit the road this next week for a GLIAC tilt at Northern Michigan. Joining us now to talk about his team is head coach Matt Mitchell as we look at this game. Coach, seems like the first half is a tale of some missed opportunities, but the second half a tale of a lot of fight by your team. Yeah, first half, obviously, the offensive, uh, you know, probably the biggest determining factor was red zone turnovers. We had the ball, um, you know, turned over inside the three-yard line, and... One was a scoop and score for a touchdown by them, so that's a 14-point swing right before half. Instead of being potentially 14-14, to it was 21-7, and then we also throw a pick in the red zone on the goal line, uh, which they scored on that drive, too. And so those are very costly turnovers, three turnovers in the first half. Um, good thing is, halftime, uh, you know, kind of regrouped, not turn the ball every second half. I thought we were efficient uh, running the ball the entire night. And then, uh, you know, Cade made some plays. Uh, definitely picked it up in the second half. Um, ran a great two-minute drill. Did some really positive things in the second half. You know, defensively, um, we were efficient on first and second down. In the first half, we struggled on third down to get off the field. They convert a lot of third and longs. Um, credit to their quarterback and their team. But I thought the Jared Barnhart, their quarterback, was fantastic. Um, throwing the ball, running, it was very difficult for it to defend. Third quarter, we got some stops. You know, we were able to get some third down stops, get the ball back to our offense, moved it. And that's why, you know, even though we were down 28 to 7, we were able to shrink that lead back. And uh, we're really close on an onside kick to getting another possession to potentially, you know, go in for the game time score. So, uh, you know, the turnovers can't happen. We got to be better on third down. Um, Ferris is a good football team. Uh, but I am uh, take away some silver linings of, of the fight our guys had uh, in the second half and uh, didn't flinch at all when the score was not towards our favor and kept battling and uh, kept going out competing. Yeah, and you look at the running game, over 200 yards on the ground, Coach. That's a really good Ferris State front seven. To be able to move the ball like you did on the ground, especially being down so big in the second half, to say a lot about your team offensively. Yeah, and I think it was a combination. Our offensive line was very physical uh, against a very physical front. Um, tight ends did a good job. We thought Jake Slager um, will be back here at some point in the season. He's one of our most dominant run-blocking tight ends, so to do it kind of without him. And then, you know, I thought our backs ran really well, uh, really physical, really got the ball to the back end of their safeties. Their safeties made some plays on us, but between that and Cade, you know, I thought Cade, on the first touchdown, drop back to pass. Um, they kind of chased a bunch of routes, and he took off, ran him for a touchdown, converted some other ones. But he also converted some key third and fourth downs with his arm. Uh, we had our quick game going, uh, which was good, um, and, and made some plays, and also got the ball out to the perimeter on some perimeter runs, too. So it just wasn't up the middle. On a rise and scores a rushing touchdown, and I think maybe it's a pass. It's a flip pass. You have uh, Cody Tierney, you know, had some of those. We had some perimeter runs, too, that accounted for some of the yardage. Absolutely, and let's, let's talk about this crowd for a second, because over 17,000 people on hand. That place was rock. It's one of the best atmospheres I've ever been a part of as a college football game. Yeah, and I probably should have let off of that. I'm very appreciative of everyone that came out, especially our student section. You know, I think there was potentially some false starts by Ferris that are directly related to our student section being backed up, and so they came and they stayed, um, even when it was 28-7 in the third quarter. Very appreciative of that, and like, it was packed. Um, you know, both sidelines were, you had your, your fans, um, you know, kind of your fans, and then the ends were the students, and it was a pretty cool atmosphere, the pom-poms. Um, just a lot of energy, awesome night for football. Um, um, tough to come up on the short end of things, but I do appreciate the people that support us. Have you ever seen four consecutive false starts in a row? Because I felt like that was all because of that student section. There There's no side. doubt, yeah. I think the student section helped it, and they ended up going to a silent count after that. I think what's disappointing for me is that we have the ball, um, you know, on the minus one, and they go 99 for a touchdown, you know, and so that's not because of our students. Students did a good job putting it in a position. Um, they converted a couple really key third downs that like led to that. So it's the third and longs that really killed us on defense, and their offense did a good job converting them. 
you, we've talked all year about not fracturing as a team. And, you know, we've, you've been tested a bit early in some games, but things seem to right themselves in time. To that, this game was the first time that really that fracture could have happened late in the game in a big game that had playoff implications, and your team didn't waver. Not at all. You know, and I think the uh, locker room after the game, um, extremely disappointed because of the work we put in, frustrated with some of the mistakes we made. You know, our team was, coaches and players, very frustrated because um, there were areas we played well and we felt good about our performance against First State, but there's some key, key critical errors, which we've already covered on this show. And then, but it's a group I think will bounce back, um, get back to work. There's still a tremendous amount to play for, especially when you start looking within our region. Um, everybody's, you know, got tagged with a loss on uh, Saturday besides Ferris, the only infinite team. And so there's really a chunk of about six schools that have one loss or one of those schools uh, with a high strength of schedule. It's really important that we uh, get back here against Northern Michigan and get back to work and there's a lot of things left to play for. Perfect peg to go and turn our attention now to Northern Michigan coming up this week. It's the second time you go across the bridge. You're coming off an emotional game. How do you get the team bounced back ready to play in this Saturday? Right, it starts obviously with a great team meeting and practice on Tuesday and get the guys back out there and just play football. That's what we do best. I've also know that, you know, as being a coach now uh, for 12 years as a head coach, that uh, 18 and 22 old males are pretty resilient. You just got to get them back in the right head space playing the sport that they love. I also think that the Dome is a unique atmosphere. It's a unique environment. Um, it's a different venue. I think that new venue, I also, I'm actually looking forward to the road trip. We have 58 players and a few coaches that are kind of on buses. That might be a good thing for us, uh, given a lot of the externalities that happened last week with the big rivalry of Ferris. Good to get back on that bus and head up to northern Michigan and get back to work. Tell us a little bit about the Wildcats. What can we expect from them on Saturday? Quarterback is leading them and obviously passing and rushing. A very active quarterback, Drake Davis, that's uh, making a lot of plays, both throwing the ball and running his feet. Um, they've had a, you know, really, two really tight games here, the last two that they've probably had leads in the fourth quarter that evaporated. Um, you know, their losses have all been within one or two scores. They play people tight, playing good on defense. Um, and again, they've played really well at home. And so that's the thing we have to be, you know, kind of guarded for is understanding the home field advantage they do have uh, up there at Marquette at the Dome. Yeah, and they're coming off a really tough loss against Michigan Tech as well. So two teams coming off rivalry losses facing off in Marquette. Should be a fun one this week again. Coach, thanks for your time. Best of luck this week. Thanks, Jake. Yep. Don't go away. The Grand Valley State Sports Report continues right after this. The GVSU women's volleyball team went 3-0 at the Midwest Regional Crossover Tournament in Hammond, Indiana over the weekend. The team now sits at 12-7 overall this season as they return home this week for a pair of games. Joining us now to talk all things Laker volleyball is head coach Jason Johnson. And coach, we've talked the last couple of weeks about the importance of this crossover tournament. We talked last week about the importance of a bounce back. That's exactly what you got. How was the weekend for you in Hammond? Uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, obviously, our kids played well going 3-0. Uh, with the competition that was put in front of us, you know, dropped a single set. So that was, it was good to see. You know, we made a couple lineup changes. We had a couple adjustments that we had to do defensively as well. But I thought our kids responded really well. We've talked the last couple of weeks about the importance of this mm -hmm. for the entire conference, for the top four teams in the GLIAC to go 11-1 and one this past weekend. That is huge for this league. It, it is. And, and when you're talking about, you know, 50-some teams in our region and only eight get into the regional tournament, you're hoping your conference does well at this event every year so that, the matches you win within your conference just help promote your case to be able to get into the NCAA tournament. I know you lost that second game last weekend against Wayne State, mm -hmm. but ever since the struggles against Saginaw Valley offensively, it seems like things have really shifted, especially this past weekend. I mean, you hit over 360 yep. in that first match this past weekend. What, what's been the key to the turnaround for the offense? Well, I think I said it early on as we've interviewed multiple times, just uh, the service passing is a big part of that. If we can keep our setter and system if we can run the offense we want to run and keep the tempo at the level we want it um, i think i've got a group of hitters that any one of the five can be successful on every night and you know i think those numbers showed that this weekend where we were able to manage our side of the court very well i thought our offense was running pretty well for the most part a few little tweaks and stuff as we go into next weekend the, the hitting numbers, as I said, in that first game were fantastic. And you just go looking through some of these. And even Rachel Jackway got in on the killing mm -hmm. a little bit. I think we've seen her step up in a little bit more into an attacking role going on too a little bit more. Is that fair to say as you've kind of seen the season progress? Yeah, I think so. Um, and again, it's just her understanding when and how to take those opportunities. Um, you know, she's not a big setter, so she's not going to get on top of the ball as often as somebody else might. But uh, she knows that there's opportunities there to put points on the board. And so we've been trying to work with her on when, when to do that and how to do it. 
you look at the, some of the numbers, and yeah, the attacking numbers were great, but another big thing that stood out to me was the errors have come way mm -hmm. down. When you're not beating yourself, obviously, you've proven that this team can be really, really tough to beat. Yeah, just in every aspect. I think one of the areas we're still focused a little bit on is our serving. I thought the errors were untimely. It wasn't that we had a lot of them. I just felt they were untimely errors. But yeah, I think the, the offensive efficiency was good. I thought the unforced errors came down quite a bit. Um, and again, that was the difference between this weekend and last. And another big weekend from Jayla Wesley. I feel like it's been every other weekend. We've mm -hmm. seen phenomenal numbers from her. She hit almost 500 in the last game of the weekend this past weekend. So yep. Jayla coming through again after a tough weekend, maybe you could say, at Saginaw and Wayne State, she really bounced back nicely for you. Yeah, she had a great weekend. Um, and she's one of them for the last couple of weeks in practice has really pushed to try to get more playing time. And, you know, it was good to see her take the opportunity and, and hit as well as she did. I think she hit. Uh, 470 on the weekend over the three matches. Um, just her energy here, enthusiasm, but her work rate when she's on the court just made a difference this weekend. For sure. And you've talked about serve receiving and passing, and obviously mm -hmm. we can see the offensive numbers. We can't see that so well on the, just looking at a box score. So who really stood out to you on the defensive side of the ball for you? Well, we made an adjustment with our libero this weekend we with our freshman, uh, Julia Blaney, um, and there were some nerves, um, definitely a little of that newness stepping into the environment, but I thought overall played a great weekend. Um, I think her service passing is still an area where she's got to continue to get better at, but I felt defensively she allowed us to move some pieces around, which actually created um, a better defensive setup for us uh, a little more consistently throughout the weekend. So I thought she did a great job. Um, Allie and Abby, Allie Thompson and Abby Graham, um, have just been anchoring this team all year with their six rotation outside hitters. They have to play defense. They have to pass and serve receive. They shoulder heavy load offensively as well. And I thought they did a great job this weekend. Six more regular season matches, four of them at home starting this weekend. Coach, we look forward to getting you back in the GVSU Fieldhouse Arena this weekend. Thanks as always for your time. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. We'll be right back with more from the Grand Valley State Sports Report on WGVU right after this. The GVSU women's golf team has student athletes coming from across the world to make Grand Valley home, and they're posting the results weekly that shows their choice was a great one. Tom Cleary has the story. This year's women's golf team at Grand Valley won't overwhelm you with its roster size. There are only seven players on the team, but it's a squad from five different countries that's starting to coalesce as the athletes from abroad get more comfortable with life here in Michigan. They've had some adjustments, but you know, the best thing about it is all the international players just appreciate the opportunity to be able to study and play golf at the same time, something that they don't do back home. The golfers on this year's Lakers squad have games as diverse as their backgrounds. Spain's Julia Sanchez is a calculating technician, while Canadian Megan Myron utilizes strength she developed playing hockey. Distance off the tee is definitely a plus for me. That's an advantage that I have, and short game, has been much improved over the summer, which has helped so much. I would say I'm really consistent. I'm not the biggest hitter, but I always go straight. So that's like a big advantage for me. And the fighter is also good. And while this year's players all have different gifts, one thing they have in common is the joy they derive from competing as a squad with teammates from different continents. It's awesome. I absolutely love, especially the Argentines and then Julia's from Spain because I'm trying to get my minor in Spanish. So they've been super helpful in whether it's like homework or just like talking to me in Spanish to get me more comfortable with it. And it's been super fun because that's an experience that I would never get if they weren't my teammates. It's way more fun because you are playing and even if you have a good have a day, you know that your teammates are out there, they are grinding and you, it motivates you so much to like keep going, keep pushing and try to do better. It's fun, different cultures, different people, different backgrounds, so it makes it diverse and interesting. You learn more about everything. If you're not a player that likes to have adrenaline when you putt and you need to take the time to actually lose your breath, do it. While golf has been a sport that's experienced fewer shutdowns during the pandemic, athletes on this team are getting reacclimated to a team structure and the pace of college competition something that did suffer when most returned home overseas last spring. I've really got five freshmen on the team this year, despite that you know four of them have been here last year. 
but none of them have experienced a normal college golf schedule, which is competing in the fall and competing in the spring. Things are just starting to feel a little bit, a little bit more normal now for us. And while travel to South America and Europe can be tedious for some on this team, there's one long trip they won't mind making when they board a plane later this month to be the first ever Grand Valley squad to play an event in Hawaii. For the Grand Valley State Sports Report, I'm Tom Cleary. GVSU women's soccer went 2-0 over the weekend, beating SVSU on the road Friday before returning home for a 4-3 thriller against Northern Michigan on Sunday. Joining us now to talk about his team is head coach Jim Conlon. And coach, a couple of games were right down to the end of regulation, but you pull them out, get two tough wins against GLIAC opponents this weekend. Yeah, you know as the season goes on, the conference is only going to get stronger. Uh, opponents know what you're doing, you know them, and so, um, you know, we, like you said, we had two thrillers this weekend. Uh, happy to come away with the wins. Two late equalizers by the other teams for your team to pull out those bounce back goals late. What does that say about the resilience of this team? Yeah, I like the mentality of the team. I think we're doing a really nice job of understanding and supporting each other. So when you get into a situation like that, they just take a deep breath, collectively regroup, and um, thankfully we were able to put the ball in the back of the net. You know, when you look on paper, maybe that Northwood Ferris State weekend had the best combined records, but these are two teams in Saginaw Valley and Northern Michigan that are very aggressive, very physical. This was probably a tough test for your team physically this weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, when you go through uh, GLIAC play, you've got several different tactics that the coaches are imploring, and obviously uh, Saginaw and, and Northern had good plans uh, this weekend, and they play good soccer, and so when they squeeze out passing lanes and, and put tight pressure on your first touch, it's hard to get in that rhythm uh, that you want to move the ball and, and play. So um, sometimes you can't look at the records. You got to look at the, the tactics and the matchups we go after. And, and that's sports. That's why you play the game. And like I said, we're excited to come away with two wins and be able to kind of crack the code, so to speak, with both of those difficult teams this weekend. Greta Deloach was massive for you this weekend. Four goals and an assist. She had the game winner last night as part of a hat trick and then also had the assist on the game winner on Friday night. What has put her in the position to be so successful in the offensive end this point of the season? Yeah, I think Greta, along with uh, most of the team, are finding their way with what we're asking of them. Um, Greta is doing a great job when she has on the ball facilitating for others and then also letting her teammates facilitate for her to put her in good positions. And I think they're really starting to come into their own, understand what each other's gifts are and, and play through each other's strengths to put themselves in, in great positions. And, and Greta obviously scored um, and was a part of many of our goals this weekend. So kudos to her, uh, but also kudos to her teammates for putting things together and, and that whole unit really starting to come together with a thing of beauty. Yeah, I'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention Katie Barron on Sunday for the play that she had. She had two really good assists, one on the ground, one through the air that set Greta up, set the table for her. Right, and, and Katie's another great example of what we're asking her to do um, a little bit more than what she's great at. And so I think you really look at her as an example of knowing what she does and has a major impact for our team, and then asking her to stretch her limits a little bit more in a few other ways is really proven to be a benefit for her and the team. It was interesting playing Northern for the second time as a conference opponent. Now in the past, the GLIAC has had you play the same team twice, but they weren't both conference games. So this was really the first time you played a team at the second time as a conference game. Did you feel a difference? Did you feel like there was anything different playing a team the second time around? Yeah, well, I think the, the big thing is what are the tactical adjustments? Um, you know, and, and in the game like yesterday, it was a completely different formation out of Northern. So, you know, I think, and, and we played a completely different formation as well from the first time. So it's really that understanding of we know what it takes to win the GLIAC. Um, you know the wins and losses to, to win a championship. But at the same time, you also have to play one game at a time and understand the nuances and alterations that can affect the scoreboard but alter and standings, but really take care of our business uh, one pass at a time, one play at a time, one defensive angle at a time. Yeah, it looked like they were playing almost a 3-6-1 against you in that game yesterday, and they had Caroline Hallinan, who was the GLIAC Offensive Player of the Year in the spring at center back. What, what about that formation kind of made things tricky early on for you guys, and how did you adjust to it? Yeah, they obviously put a lot of numbers in the middle, and they take a very talented player and move her all over the field. And so you don't really know what to fully expect. You know, if she's on the front foot as an attacker, 
that's going to give one look. If she's on the back line anchoring that, it's going to give a different line, a uh, different look. So I think them just having a lot of numbers in the middle um, allows different spaces on the field that, that open up. And we just have to, we had to do a good job of possessing in tight spaces to get it to the, the areas that we did have a little bit more time and area to work with. Not only was Sunday a thrilling game, but it was also awesome to get all those alumni back to celebrate the 25th season of GVSU soccer. You had everybody back, including people from the very first class. Tell us a bit about what it was like to have them back and then also what their kind of message to the team was after the game. Uh, having the alumni back was tremendous, really, really tremendous. I mean, just any time you can get back the women that have come before the current team, you understand that it's bigger than you. You understand that it's bigger than any one player, bigger than any one coach. And the messages uh, from the women, like you said, from the very first team all the way through um, some players that are still finishing up their degrees now, were simple. Enjoy every moment that you have in it. It is going to be crazy. It's going to go by fast. Lean on your teammates. Those teammates really help you get through good times and tough times. And there are lessons that you are going to learn as an intercollegiate athletic athlete, in particular a GVSU women's soccer player with the level of commitment that it takes that is going to transcend and prepare you for the workforce. We heard that over and over last night from the alums that we will be more ready than some out there just because of the excellent standards that we live by day by day. It had to be so cool for some of those players and alumni to come back and see not only the team being the number one team in the country undefeated on the season, but also seeing the video board, the press box, and the way this thing has grown as a whole. And that's really cool for them as well. So a great weekend overall, Coach. Congratulations on two more wins, and thanks as always for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back with more on the Grand Valley State Sports Report. The GVSU football team is nationally ranked this season due in no small part to the big men up front. Tom Cleary has the story. Green, 10. <laughs> the object of attention in Lubber Stadium each fall is the football. Teams and players spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to throw it, catch it, run with it, kick it when they have it, and get it back when they don't. Ball tipped up in the air and picked off. But many of the biggest and strongest players do none of those things. They're the linemen who are the foundation of all great teams. There's the parallel between training to be a man, being a great husband, be a great dad, be a great businessman, engineer, whatever you choose to be, and being an offense lineman, because it is. It, it, the, the glory part of it isn't there, but the relishing in the success of somebody else, that's what we wake up in the morning to do, absolutely. Booster spent more than a decade at Wayne State in Detroit before coming to Allendale, and he's immediately taken a shine to his first group of players as they have to him. That's it, good. Him coming from a school like Wayne State, always had a great offensive line, so he understood what it took to be a great offensive lineman, and we had the tools to do it, just had to kind of tune everyone in. When Coach Booster came in, he watched us on tape. He knew what we were good at and what we were bad at. Um, and he, uh, we attacked that over uh, this fall and spring. And while players on the offensive line try to protect and help their teammates who handle the ball, defensive linemen specialize in disruption and havoc which is just the way they and their coach like it. We have to be in a mindset to where as I don't care who that guy is across from me, like I'm gonna make sure that I'm bringing it consistently with that physicality, with that disruptiveness that you're talking about. And I think a lot of guys have that within our group and that's something that's been able to translate to the success that we've been able to have so far this season. Yeah, I think defensive line's a game of you know a lot of emotion, there's a lot of intensity you have to have and just having a young guy with a lot of energy and a lot of uh, motivation, I think, it's, I think it's great, it really gets us to play hard. While Grand Valley has had numerous great linemen on both sides of the ball in the past, in the eyes of many, no Laker team has had the kind of depth this one possesses. The season takes its toll on big guys who collide on every play, which is why people like Bibbs and Wooster don't just focus on their starters. The biggest thing that I've been pleased about is just the selflessness that they have for each other. Because defensive line, you don't always get the glory, you don't always get the statistics, but you do all the dirty work. Uh, and just the love that these guys have for one another. Uh, it's been fun to watch. The way they come to work every day, the way they are just sponges to learn, 
um, watch the tape get better every single day. It's been incredible, incredible time. While Grand Valley looked good this year in its first game in almost two years against Colorado State Pueblo, the Lakers truly became a force in dominating road wins at Michigan Tech and Saginaw Valley. And while the rest of us spend our Saturdays fixated on the pigskin, Matt Mitchell's players in the trenches mostly concern themselves with winning the approval of Jalen Bibbs and Scott Wooster. For the Grand Valley State Sports Report, I'm Tom Cleary. That's all the time we have this week on the Grand Valley State Sports Report. The GVSU football team will head to the UP once again for a game against Northern Michigan on Saturday. Kickoff is scheduled for 1 p.m. GVSU women's soccer will stay home to start the weekend as they take on Michigan Tech at 4 p.m. on Friday. They'll then make their way across town for a match against Davenport on Sunday. Kickoff for that game is scheduled for 11 a.m. GVSU Volleyball will return home from a long few weeks on the road as they square off with Lake Superior State on Friday at 7 p.m. After a day of rest, they'll be back at it against Northwood for a 2 p.m. matchup in Allendale at the GVSU Fieldhouse Arena. For upcoming games as well as live broadcasts of every Laker athletic program, visit GVSULakers.com. To see more of this show, head to our YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash WGVU35. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to get updated video and highlights all year long. For the entire crew here at WGVU, I'm Jake Levy. Have a great week, Laker Nation, and as always, anchor up. On Anderson, topside now. Grand Valley looking for throw. Kate's going to have to get rid of it. Oh, he breaks out of there. He's going to pick up the first down. He's going to score a touchdown. Nope. Wow. No flags, and that's exactly what Coach Mitchell talked about. He's excited to have a quarterback that can run like Gabe Peterson. What a great job of feeling the pressure from the outside. Stepped up, was looking downfield to see, but he saw that big gap, a lot of green, and took it down the middle for the big touchdown, Kate Peterson.